Hello, welcome to Memo Conversations. I'm video producer Osman Butt. Our topic today is archaeology, preservation and heritage in Gaza and the Arabian Peninsula. My guest today is Georgia Andreo. Georgia is an assistant lecturer in Near Eastern Archaeology at the Institute for Archaeology at UCL. She is also a senior researcher at the Center for Maritime Archaeology at the University of Southampton. Her research combines archaeology with data science to examine the impact of natural and cultural processes on coastal uh, archaeological sites in the Middle East. Her current project, book project title, Critical Heritage Underwater, explores the potential, but also the ethical challenges of big data set analyses in the context of maritime archaeology in eastern in the eastern mediterranean she has previously held positions at cornell and brown university she had worked on numerous archaeological sites on the island of cyprus including the uh, direction of the cyprus ancient shoreline project and the co-direction of the Oh, uh, Kava, Kava, Kava sauce. Uh, you're going to have to correct me on the pronunciation there, sorry. And Maroni built environmental projects. She is currently directing the Gaza Maritime Archaeology Project, the aim of which is to develop low cost methods for sustainable monitoring of activities deteriorating cultural heritage. Uh, Georgia, welcome to Memo Conversations. Thank you very much. Thanks for the invitation. And apologies for the pronunciations. <laughs> I'm wondering, though, um, so we'll start with uh, you personally, because you obviously are interested in archaeology. You teach archaeology. Um, you're interested in marine archaeology as well. So what got you interested in these uh, in archaeology in the first place, uh, specifically and marine archaeology and also why the Middle East? So I I am from and I grew up on the island of Cyprus, which is an area very rich in history and archaeology. I originally went to study history at the University of Cyprus, and that was actually a joint degree, history and archaeology. So as part of this degree, I had the opportunity to work on archaeological excavations on the island, and I got really fascinated with the material culture. So I'm also interested on the ways we produce narratives about material culture. So how do we go from an object to producing a historical narrative? And broadly, I'm interested in the ethics and the politics of excavating, curating materials, but also putting together the information to produce a historical narrative. So while I was working uh, on my PhD 10 years ago, I was focusing on the south central coast of Cyprus. And one of the people that uh, shared material with me, and we are longstanding collaborators, he brought to my attention an actively deteriorating coastal archaeological site. And that site was dating to the second millennium BC, which is the period that, that I'm specializing on. So we kept revisiting the site for a couple of years observing the dramatic impact of coastal erosion on it. And when I say dramatic, I mean over one meter of land was being lost every year. So I decided to do a more systematic study to try and quantify the erosion, understand what causes the erosion, but also to understand how does this erosion affect the way we write the history in the Eastern Mediterranean. So. If that site wasn't documented by us, it would never make it in literature and it would never make it in broader historical interpretations. So coastal erosion is something that is affecting the entire Mediterranean and particularly the Eastern Mediterranean. So the Eastern Mediterranean is a major area for maritime interaction. And many of our narratives rely on these large and extensively studied sites, particularly harbors. In reality, however, there is a massive number, basically an unknown number of maritime archaeological sites that are disappearing faster than they can be documented. So these sites, as I mentioned, they rarely make it in historical narratives. So the project I directed at the time in Cyprus was trying to put together all available information to understand how many sites have been lost. So we're putting together textual information, archaeological information, cartographic and ethnographic information. Now, moving on to the Middle East, Cyprus is sort of 
in the middle. You can study it from the perspective of the Middle East. You can also study it from the perspective of classical studies. So it combines different research traditions. And depending on what you want to investigate, you engage with different research traditions. So the Middle East, of course, is an area key in global history. The earliest cities were founded in the region, and it also provides substantial evidence for international interaction, which is something that I find very fascinating. And I'm also interested in the very complex heritage politics in the Middle East, which is something that I'm exploring in my upcoming book. So I'm interested in how heritage is used to claim land, but also why and how we ascribe value to heritage. And this is sort of what brought me into the case of Gaza. Yes, it's kind of interesting because when you talk about erosion of uh, land, we're, we're not necessarily just talking about archaeological sites that are right on the beach. Some of them are quite deep in land, but over the yeah. many centuries, as the coast drawing draws nearer and nearer, they start to disappear. What is the sort of, you know, some of the big factors as to why this is happening? So in the Eastern Mediterranean, certainly damming rivers. So rivers are bringing sediment down to the coast, which is protecting them from erosion. But when you cut off the sediment, the erosion is accelerating. And when we are losing over a uh, half meter of land every year, it's described as accelerated and it's just generally ascribed to non-natural factors, so to peeped humans. Also, the construction of breakwaters to protect the specific area, whether it's you know, private property or a hotel or an industrial center, is essentially redirecting the waves toward another area that potentially has an archaeological site. But when these breakwaters are developed, there hasn't always been a, you know, an archaeological assessment or an environmental assessment. It takes time to assess their impact. So you realize their impact after they have been constructed, essentially. So these are the two main drivers. OK, so what I'm getting here is that because I sort of wondered to myself, you know, to what extent is it um, just a natural process that happens that you lose land to the sea every year? Let's say there was no humans in that area would we see land being lost? But from what I'm picking up from this, it seems that humans are critical to the to degradation of the um, coastline. Um, and it's maybe, is there any also evidence that it may have sped up with re like developments over the ages? Yes, and actually um, since the 50s, we believe that it has accelerated. So it's extremely unlikely that since antiquity, we've been losing one meter of land every year. Uh, we are able to observe this acceleration when we are comparing satellite imagery, which has been available primarily from the 80s onwards. And we also have some aerial images from the 60s. So we can see, we can compare the images and see how the shoreline has changed. And that brings us very nicely to the project you're working on on Gaza. Um, and Gaza is a very, I think, possibly interesting example of this, because of course, as we know, it's a country that it's a, sorry, a place which is currently obviously under siege from Israel, which it's been for the last, you know, what year are we going on now? 15, 16 years now. Um, and there's about, what, 2 million people thereabouts living in the Strip. And in terms of a lot of archaeological sites, I know from my own sort of research that a lot of people are building on top of archaeological sites in Gaza, like homes. There are people living there. There is all sorts of things happening. And a lot of this is not because there's a disregard for the past per se, it's because they have nowhere else to go. So could you perhaps tell us more about the work you're doing in Gaza? So yeah, as you mentioned, uh, it's among the most densely populated areas on the planet and there's very limited space to live. And some of the archeological sites present in Gaza are actually large. So perhaps one of the sites that is uh, more widely known, Tel Sakan, it's estimated to be between five and eight hectares of land. So this land is extremely valuable. So in conditions of economic, environmental and humanitarian crises, it's not surprising that heritage is deprioritized. So what we are doing uh, with the project, we're involved in Gaza. The project is called Gaza Maritime Archaeology Project and we use the acronym Gaza Map. And it's a project that I'm directing with Yasmin El Hudari, who is based at the Council of British Research in the Levant. So the aim of our project 
is to develop a collaborative network of specialists that have complementary skills that have been that can be used for the documentation and monitoring of maritime heritage. So we're developing time and cost effective methods to document maritime heritage. So maritime heritage is not necessarily found under the water. It's any type of heritage that provides information on how people engage with the sea. So much of maritime heritage is found on the coast, but some maritime heritage may be found in land presently, but in the past it was coastal, for example, Telesakan. So we offered training to students from the Islamic University of Gaza, both archaeology students and geography students. We involved 11 students last year and 15 this year. Uh, and we produced a digital collection form, which can be used on students' smartphone, in order to document archaeological features. So these features are documented as geotagged photographs. Originally, we wanted to import uh, DSLR cameras and GPS devices so that they could do that this way, but it, it wasn't possible to do that. So instead, they're using their smartphones and the digital forms that we developed. So we can take these geotagged photographs and analyze them in geographic software and identify different patterns. So we can see where is the higher density of pottery, where is the higher density of architecture, and what does that potentially mean? So central in our aims is to build knowledge and capacity among heritage and geography professionals in Gaza, but also to engage other professionals that have skills, but also equipment that is regularly used in archaeological research, but it's inaccessible to archaeologists in Gaza Strip. So we are involving, for example, media producers that are regularly using drones in their work. So they document the sites, but they also offer training to students. We also involve civil engineers that produce topographical plans of the sites, but they also teach students how to use this equipment, which is, these are standard skills in the context of landscape archaeology, but obviously they're not accessible to students and to heritage professionals in Gaza. So the project is documenting so far four archaeological sites. Last year, we focused on Teles Sakan, which is the largest and the most emblematic archaeological site in the Gaza Strip. It's the earliest Egyptian colony in the southern Levant, and it regularly figures on the news for various reasons, particularly uh, its state of preservation. It's one of those sites that appears on the news as it's being bulldozed, people are building on top of it. It's the main site that people mention. We also documented Tel Rakaish, it's not as extensively known as Tel Esakan, but it's actually, it's an extremely important site, a massive fortified site that dates to the first millennium BC. So we would call it, let's say it's a Phoenician harbor. And it's very likely mentioned in ancient Greek texts as part of major port cities that were linking Gaza and Egypt. Now, half of this site has eroded Coastal erosion is in Gaza is extremely serious, particularly since the construction of the Aswan Dam, which was bringing sediment, protecting the coast. But now the coast is, is eroding in an accelerated manner. So half of the site is under the water. The majority of the site has eroded. So there isn't actually too much to document under the water, but there is enough so that we are able to reconstruct the economy of the site. Um, part of the site is protected by the ministry. We don't actually know the extent of the site. Uh, so about 200 by 200 meters are protected, but this year we're exploring the actual extent of the site. Students are walking in the general area and they're documenting surface remains. And we believe that Potentially, it is up to four kilometers long, the actual seafront that was used during the first millennium BC. And it's, include, it's including other areas that we know that archaeological sites have been found that are contemporaneous, like Tel Katif, Tel Ridan. So these are lesser known sites uh, because they are not as visible as, for example, Tel Esakan. So that the project is actually ongoing at the moment. Students took a break because of the heat wave. And this year we're also involving the local community. So Yasmin is running various workshops with local schools, but with 
also with local community, uh, many of whom are, are very happy to provide information, particularly memories of how the sites used to look like 30, 40, 50 years ago, which is extremely valuable for us. And you sort of um, we're sort of touching on another question I had, which is about the overall state of heritage in Gaza, because as you've mentioned, there's obviously a lot of erosion happening. But what is, I mean, first of all, give us a sort of sense of how many you know heritage sites are there in Gaza, for a start. So um, a couple of years ago, well, last year actually we published a paper that was trying to put together all available information on the archaeology of Gaza. And it was primarily combining satellite imagery and some maps that were produced uh, during the British mandate. Using that only, so without accessing the ground, we documented about uh, just over a hundred sites. But this is just a snapshot of how much archaeology there is in the Gaza Strip. The earlier said that we documented is Neolithic, so it's about 10,000 years old. But we know based on the archaeology in the broader region that humans were present in the general area for hundreds of thousands of years before that. But the preservation of those locations is very poor. So it's they are likely not that visible. I have been in touch with other researchers that are putting together other information that was excavated uh, in the last 100 years. And they mentioned that they know at least 200 sites. So I'm not able to tell you how many sites there are, but the minimum would be 200. I think it, it, there's a, a substantial number of archaeological sites. And you know, if we assume we would consider archaeology something that is you know, 80 years old or traditional structures or some sanctuaries that have local importance. So if we put all, take all this into consideration, I don't think I'm able to tell you how many sites there are. A, a, a very, very large number and a very high density of sites. And many of them are not visible. So Tel Sakan, which I, I keep bringing as an example, which is the largest archeological site in Gaza, it was accidentally found. So it was a massive uh, artificial mountain, 15 meters tall, I think, five to eight hectares area. And it was accidentally found during the construction of buildings. So you can imagine just how much there is under the ground. I think you've given us a very good sense of the scale of this thing. Um, it is. It seems like there's a lot, given how small Gaza is, um, I think it's also interesting when you talked about the impact of the Aswan Dam, because for our audience, Aswan Dam is not in Gaza, it's in Egypt. It's quite far away. And yet something that far away still has an impact on Gaza. Um, and I suppose I also have more questions, more questions about what else is impacting the heritage in Gaza. You know, what is the overall state? I mean, I think it's no secret to anyone who's you know read anything about Gaza that they do have a lot of issues in addition to the sea obviously you have the siege but they've also had things such as repeated Israeli airstrikes they've had they have financial issues they have density population so what is the actual overall state of you know archaeology in Gaza it's not great I mean there are various factors that are uh, making archaeological work extremely difficult. Um, so coastal erosion is actually among the top factors preventing the preservation of sites, but it's also limited funds. So the majority of uh, funds uh, used in heritage are coming from abroad. I think it's almost, I think it's 100%. And there's also very, very limited opportunity for people to acquire the skills to document the heritage, to monitor heritage. Um, there are more skills in the conservation. And I'm not even talking about being able to do further research or publish. I'm talking about the basic level of documenting what is appearing, what is appearing and soon disappearing. Um, so, and it's also difficult for them to engage with international scholarship because there are no resources. And obviously heritage is, is deprioritized in the context of humanitarian crisis. There have been several narratives trying to suggest that looting is a major factor. It's actually not the major factor. 
Building construction is a major factor for obvious reasons. Airstrikes have affected the, the condition of the sites and actually forensic architecture did a documentary, um, a short documentary about the Anthedon Harbor where they showed specifically areas that have been affected by the airstrikes. Um, but the main factor is um, the, the continuous use of land because people live there and they have nowhere else to live. You've also, I mean, I suppose the next question is um, related to, you know, more about, you know, Gaza's past. I mean, a lot of people, when, for example, you mention that there is archaeology in Gaza, are surprised Gaza has any heritage. I've encountered that more than once to be able to say this. Um, and I just, I think partly, you know, when people think about the region and they think about its heritage, they tend to think of Jerusalem for obvious reasons, West Bank, which features of much, much more. But for some reason, Gaza doesn't get thought about. So what is it about, you know, Gaza that makes it interesting for people interested in archaeology or heritage to study? I mean, in general, as you mentioned, the Southern Levant has attracted a lot of attention for the past couple of centuries for religious and for political purposes. So before archaeology was a profession or even a discipline, various explorers or visitors, they were coming into this area to find cities mentioned in the Bible and sort of try and verify the contents of the Bible. And this actually continues nowadays and it's attracting substantial funds. And we also have the political reasons as part of the colonial project uh, that produced maps of the general area. So among the resources mapped, cultural resources were mapped, which provided information about the local population. And we know that heritage plays a crucial role in politics nowadays, particularly when there's a strong interest in the historic right of people to live in a specific land. Gaza is central in such conversations. Cyprus used to be central in such conversations. Now, Gaza specifically has a very long-standing history and archaeology. It's known since antiquity as the boundary between Egypt and the different empires of the Middle East. So the Wadi Gaza has been considered the natural boundary between Egypt and the rest of the Near East. And we have a large number of sites along the Wadi Gaza. So it occupies a very strategic location in terms of economy, and in terms of politics from antiquities to nowadays. So it has central role in the Eastern Mediterranean trade and it was connecting the markets of the Middle East with the Mediterranean, similar to other major cities that are found along the Levantine coast. Yes, it's- so uh, it, oh. Sorry, sh they shouldn't be surprised that there is such a large number of sites in the Gaza Strip. Yeah, it's it's interesting because uh, I was going to say, you know, the history of Gaza is that there's a lot of different civilizations interacting there as well. I mean, they found ancient Egyptian, uh, I believe it was a cemetery where they had buried sarcophagus of ancient Egyptian in Gaza. That was found because I think it was an uh, ancient Egyptian outpost. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but also you've had others there. You've had Hellenic civilizations settling there. You've had Alexander the Great laid siege to Gaza at one point. Um, so there's a lot of layers to history. And I'm sort of wondering, you know, what was it about Gaza that attracted so many people, you know, so many civilizations? It was a very well connected area. So it was close enough to Egypt, it was close enough to the different empires of the Near East, but oftentimes it was also enjoying a more independent status. So it was able to, it wasn't necessarily part of empires when the major empires were interacting. So it was able to sort of provide services and engage in trade with different, um, it was part of different economic networks, essentially. So. It, in terms of location, it's considered strategic. The broader Eastern Mediterranean, of course. So it has access to the sea, but it also has access to, to the mainland of, of the Middle East. Yeah, and it's, uh, and it's not just an ancient thing. It's something that continues right up into the modern period. I mean, you had 
I think Napoleon passed through Gaza as well. There's the famous house he slept in, which I think is now a museum, um, has all things with Napoleon seem to turn into. Um, so, yeah, it's a very, you know, very interesting area with, you know, a long history to it. And it's in a way it's kind of, you know, melancholic when you think about what Gaza has happened to Gaza today, because effectively the story today is a Gaza that is cut off from the rest of the world. Um, it's certainly not as connected as it was in antiquity. <laughs> so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you've also done, you know, other work as well. I mean, you've done because Gaza, obviously, I don't think was your first, you know, place you did. I mean, obviously, you mentioned Cyprus, but you've been doing a lot of work in the Arabian Peninsula as well, um, and you've done research on relate things related to the cyclones which hit, hit uh, Oman climate change so what did all this research in the Arabian Peninsula first of all why were you interested in the Arabian Peninsula and what did your sort of research uncover there so this research is part of um of my job at the University of Southampton I'm a researcher at the Maritime Endangered Archaeology Project which aims to rapidly document and assess endangered maritime archaeology in the Middle East and North Africa so each researcher is assigned a region to focus on, and I just happen to be assigned uh, Oman. Now, Oman, of course, is a region that has long-standing maritime history, and it has a substantial number of Islamic cities that were central in international trade, particularly as part of the maritime Silk Roads. So alongside the creation of an inventory of sites, which is part of this project, we are also focusing on trying to understand, to identify, but also quantify different threats to heritage, whether these are natural or anthropogenic. So natural as in flooding or erosion, anthropogenic as in building construction, tourist development, and so on. So while I was working uh, in the documentation of sites, I came across videos of the um, cyclone Shaheen was in 2021, I think, which impacted Oman, Iran, the UAE. So I then realized that cyclones are actually a frequent phenomenon in the Arabian Peninsula. So they seem to be documented at least uh, once a year. And then I realized that it has even been argued that the frequency of the cyclones and the intensity of the cyclones increased due to climate change. Uh, so we actually don't know how frequent they were in antiquity because they weren't documented in the way that they're documented nowadays. In any case, I used the uh, computer software to put together information on the location and the intensity of different cyclones because this information is freely available, which offers substantial opportunity to archeologists to conduct research. And I combined that with heritage big data, so large databases with the location of sites, just to identify which sites are the most vulnerable. So the Dofar Governorate in Oman, which is the one uh, at the border with Yemen, appears to be the most vulnerable to cyclones. And then I focus specifically on one archeological site, Al Balid, which is a medieval harbor city. And I was able to find imagery before and after Shaheen. So this imagery is freely available. You can check it on Google Earth and you can see image one day before the cyclone and then two days after the cyclone, just to see how it impacted the site. So through this comparison, my colleagues and I were able to find areas, identified specific parts of the site that were affected by flooding and erosion. So in this respect, we developed a system through which this information can be analyzed and can help us prioritize sites according to their vulnerability. So in the case of future cyclones, heritage professionals on the ground and policymakers know which site to examine first and assess its condition, but they also know how to apply different um, computational analysis in order to remotely assess the condition of the site, especially if it's inaccessible. So producing this heritage big data as part of the project in Southampton and combining them with open access data that pertain to, they're called global observation data. It allows us to make data informed decisions for the protection and monitoring of heritage, which is more sustainable, it's low cost, and it can also be remote. I think while I praise 
this uh, available data, I think it's important to stress that we should also be reflecting on the quality of such global observation data. Many of them that have been used to produce models that say this is how the coastline will look in 100 years or this is how sea level will be in 100 years. Many of them rely on satellite imagery. There are, the resolution of which is low and doesn't always take into consideration the impact of people, which is substantial. So actually in a couple of weeks, we are publishing a paper in Near Eastern Archaeology and we are talking about the different biases that are affecting the way we assume that the landscape will look like in 100 years. And of course, Gaza is our case study because there is substantial impact of people on the coastline. Hmm, yes, it's uh, so when you talk about ancient cyclones, I'm wondering, though, I mean, obviously, we know when a cyclone hits today because we got news reports, people document on the ground. But I'm wondering, does a cyclone leave any like telltale signs behind, you know, you know, physically, you know, for example, you know, you can sort of tell when an earthquake has happened even 100 years after just based on the way the you know ground has formed and that kind of thing, things with the rock. Does a cyclone leave any kind of telltale sign like that? So, I mean, it's uh, nowadays we have ways to classify wind. So if it's not a cyclone, it's a very strong wind or like a hurricane that cannot be described as cyclone. This is not exactly something that we can measure for the past, but we can certainly see the impact. Uh, we can see through geoarchaeology whether there was a sudden flooding or sudden erosion or, or, or if there was a layer of... Um, of um, extensive rain. So it can be, and it has been identified. So people can see whether and when what is overflooded and how much they overflooded and if they potentially affected sites. So in the case of Oman, there's also a medieval site, Kalhat, which is a UNESCO site. And on that archeologists were able to identify evidence of a past. If it wasn't a cyclone, it was a, an event or like a hurricane that caused flooding and erosion that severely affected the site. So actually in this respect, archeology span is extremely important because it provides historical information on, on the climate, which can inform future projections. So this is something that is presently lacking and it's slowly building up. We can also identify high precipitations through uh, tree rings. So there is substantial research being done in the Eastern Mediterranean on that. If you have pieces of wood preserved or charcoal, researchers are able to identify how much, whether there was drought or whether there was very high precipitation that is related to a very drastic, to something drastic. What is it about tree rings? Every time, you know, there's something that happened a long time ago, I, oh yes, it's in the tree rings. What's it about trees that contains all this information? So uh, the trees are growing, each ring is, one ring is produced every year. So the thickness of the ring uh, is sort of an indication. It depends on the type of the tree, of course, because you cannot get this information from all the trees, but depending on the thickness of the ring, you're able to determine the precipitation. And then the wood is something that can be dated uh, through scientific methods can be absolutely dated. So you have a very narrow window of chronologies comparing to, for example, pottery or any other type of material culture. Mm. And when you talk about damage done to Omani sites, give us a sense of what kind of damage you've uncovered. I mean, first of all, you know, you're talking about these sort of sites, you know, al Dafar near Ye uh, the Yemeni border. You know, how big are these sites? And, you know, what kind of damage are we looking at? So in the case of Al-Balid, for example, uh, we know that um, it wasn't even a cyclone. I think it was a hurricane in 2013, exposed a 15th century shipwreck on the beach. So that shipwreck was documented because someone happened to notice it. If no one noticed it, it would just disappear and it would never be documented. So like that there is unknown but large numbers of buried um, objects that 
as soon as they're exposed, they're, they, they will never be preserved. There was, uh, I think at Alpalit, there's also a cemetery that was excavated under where the sand is. So if that cemetery was unknown to archaeologists, it could have easily been exposed and then disappear within a matter of a few weeks and no one would know about it. Uh, flooding is affecting the state of preservation of the site and the erosion of the, of the coastal scarp. It's kind of eating through the site, essentially. So you're losing information. And even though, you know, cyclone is not something that we can prevent, uh, but at least if we know that certain sites are very vulnerable, we can at least document, visit them after such event so that we document whatever is exposed and we have this information before it disappears. So this information can actually be used later when we produce the history of the site. So looking beyond, you know, cyclones, because I think one of the issues, because you also touched on climate change as well, and one of the issues with the Middle East is that it's one of the fastest heating regions in the world. You know, it's going a bit faster than the global average. I think it's by a degree, um, according to different measurements. And so I'm wondering, you know, what are the other sort of impacts climate change is having on these sites, you know, across the region? Sea level change, so there some areas would be under the water within the next 50 to 100 years. Then it has been argued that certain phenomena are more intensive, like cyclones or different types of storms or unpredictable precipitation. So these are affecting. There has been some research conducted on how the temperature of the sea is affecting the preservation of underwater remains. Uh, but I think we should keep in mind that the impact of people on the ground is also substantial in the preservation of sites. So it's not, we shouldn't blame everything on climate change. Okay, and uh, thinking about uh, the future of archaeology in the Middle East, what do you think, what do you, you know, see as being the thing that a new generation of archaeologists need to consider when they pursue their work in this area? So I'm assuming you're referring to future archaeologists that are from the Middle East, I'm assuming, uh, or broad. We can do both. We can do, we'll do both. We have time. I mean, archaeological work in the Middle East has been interdisciplinary and it will continue to be. So projects employ a wide area of specialists, soil specialists, treating specialists, uh, so it's important for archaeology students, particularly from the region, to invest in different skills. And in the recent years, there has been an abundance of open access data sets that are relevant to environment and climate. So in my view, the future of archaeological work is to be able to leverage this data, combine them with archaeological data, and explore the history of the region through different resolutions and through different angles. Uh, it's important also to note that the future is increasingly decolonized. So the future of archaeology in the region will hopefully be written by local voices or in actively incorporating local voices. And we will continue to reflect on the narratives that were produced as part of the colonial project. So now more than ever, there is space for archaeologists from the Middle East to take lead in projects, to produce historical narratives, which is something that is unprecedented. And it's, it's very important to provide opportunities for these students at the moment. So of course, this is one of the goals that we have in the Gaza Maritime Archaeology Project. So beyond providing those skills to students, we also want to create opportunities for them to pursue further studies outside of Palestine so that they engage with the broader international community and they bring their own perspectives as people engaging with their heritage on a daily basis. Mm. And uh, just about your future work, I mean, you've mentioned you've got a book coming out. Um, maybe you can tell us a bit about that, but also what is it you're going to pursue in the future? What is your, what are you, what are you eyeing up? My current focus is the project in the Gaza Strip, and I want to invest more in, on community engagement in the area. And at the same time, I want to reflect on the ethical and the political dimensions of this type of work. I mentioned earlier, this is one of the aims of my book, 
which is looking specifically on how we study underwater heritage in the Eastern Mediterranean. There are certain areas that, um, particularly international waters or contested waters, that archaeology has been documented in ways that would not necessarily be acceptable if that archaeology was on the ground. Uh, a recent example has been the, the identification of uh, 12 shipwrecks between Cyprus and Lebanon. Um, also conducting work in contested waters, for example, in northern Cyprus, but also off the shore of the Gaza Strip. So an example is um, there have been two Phoenician shipwrecks uh, documented in an area that would be part of the exclusive economic zone of Palestine, but they were documented uh, by um, Israeli archaeologists and published as being of Ashkelon and regularly cited as such. Uh, but there isn't, there aren't enough conversations on the ethics and politics of conducting such type of work. So on the one hand, we want to document and protect heritage, and it's often the priority. But I also think we need to reflect on our role as archaeologists in the broader political landscape of the region. And uh, your book, which is coming out, uh, what is that going to explore? It's focusing on that. So it covers oh, okay. how we engage with maritime heritage in contested waters. But it's also reflecting on the potential and the challenges of global data sets in the production of narratives. So I mentioned earlier that there is a number of projects that are collecting a lot of uh, archaeological information. They're producing large data sets on the Middle East, but they're based outside of the Middle East. They're run by specialists that are not necessarily from there. This information is not always accessible to archaeologists from the region. So there is a level of inequality here that we need to reflect on and the way specialists engage with uh, local communities. And I think this will be exacerbated now that increasingly more information is made available, which is described as freely available, but actually not everyone has the infrastructure to access it, not everyone has the infrastructure to analyze it. So these are also aspects that I'm discussing in the book. Georgia Andreo, thank you for talking to us at Memo Conversations. Pleasure. And to our audience, thank you for tuning in. If you've missed any previous uh, episodes of Memory Conversations, you can find that on our website. But I'd also like to thank you for tuning in. Please do tune in next time for more Memory Conversations.